My name is David, and I'm also one of the pastors here at Perdido Bay United Methodist Church. It is our joy to welcome all of you here and worship with us this morning. We are in this sermon series entitled, This Is Us, and we're talking about the different characteristics and attributes of what it means to be a Christian disciple. And some eight months ago now, when we were prayerfully discerning the, the ones we wanted to address in this sermon series and where God was calling us with the scriptures, uh, we, we picked the word just for this week. It's been an interesting word to, to look at justice, particularly in um, our world's environment today. And so this morning, to uh, better understand just what it means to be just and to better understand justice, we're looking at 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses help? Little children, let us love not in word or speech, but in truth and action. This is the word of God for the people of God. We are called to be just. And uh, whenever I think about justice and uh, I, I start to think about social justice, I start to think about civil justice, even secular justice, I feel like that it is my obligation as uh, one of your pastors to share with you some laws. These are civil laws that I really, really think that you need to know about because you probably don't. These are particular to the state of Florida. So if you don't, if you live across the line and you travel over, just remember when you're over here that these apply to you. Uh, many of you know that the Florida State Constitution calls for freedom of speech and it calls for a trial by jury. And it also calls, as you probably know, that pregnant pigs are not to be confined in cages. Did you know that? Yes. It is number 10, Constitutional Amendment, Article 10, Section 19. It reads these words. No person shall confine a pig during pregnancy in a cage, crate, or other enclosure. Wonder where you put them. Or a tenant a pig on a farm so that the pig is prevented from turning around freely. Only for veterinary purposes may you confine a pregnant pig. Now, I'm not going to give you the place in the Constitution where all of these are. You can check with me after. But also, our state constitution says, women may be fined for falling asleep under a hairdryer, as can the salon owner. I guess that's why they put out those exciting magazines. I don't know. A, a special law prohibits unmarried women from parachuting on Sunday, or she shall risk arrest, fined, and or jailing. Now, you can be a married woman and parachute on Fridays and Sundays and Mondays and Tuesdays, and you can be an unmarried man and parachute any day of the week. But if you're an unmarried woman, don't do it on Sundays. You might end up in jail. If an elephant is left tied to a parking meter in the state of Florida, the parking fee has to be paid as it would be for a vehicle. <laughs> it is illegal to sing in a public place while attired in a swimsuit. Now, I know I've broken that law, so I just want to make sure that you know. I haven't broken the elephant one yet, but, you know, I have sung in public in my swimming drawers. Men may not be seen publicly in any kind of strapless gown. <laughs> Imagine the arguments on the floor of the state legislature that transpired in order for us to get a law in the Constitution that says men may not be seen publicly in any kind of strapless gown. Citizens shall not dress or undress on any beach or in any vehicle, toilet or other place, except in such bathing houses or structures as may be provided for that purpose. Every time I've gone to Johnson's Beach, I've broken that law. I mean, you change in your car. Well, you're not going to go into the bathing house. And for our city mandates, this is just in Pensacola, citizens may not be called downtown without at least ten dollars on their person did you know that that's a pensacola law it is illegal to roll a barrel on any street within the confines of pensacola fines go up according to the contents of the barrel <laughs> a woman can be fined in the city of pensacola only after death for being electrocuted in a bathtub because of using self-beautification utensils and no one may bring a pig with them to the beach. You can go across the floor, Alabama. I looked it up. In Alabama, you can take a pig on the beach with you. You just can't do it in the area that's known as Pensacola. I don't know. God had a lot of hang-ups with pigs in the Old Testament, and evidently Floridians do too. While we do have these ridiculous laws in Florida and everywhere, 
I mean, they really are. I don't know, years ago, they get put on the books for some good reason, I'm sure, or maybe even not, and they're still just stuck there. We also have a lot of great injustices all around us, everywhere. We have a crisis today. Because we're supposed to be the decent people, because the United States of America is supposed to be the good and moral compass of the world, because we think we have evolved and that there are not injustices around us maybe immediately, we are not so sure that we are in a crisis. But we are. There are just as many injustices, if not more, all around us as Bible has constantly spoken about and into for the last 2,000 years. I looked up on the FBI website uh, last year in our state alone, just in Florida, 105 persons were arrested for trafficking and owning human slaves. Seven were considered involuntary servants. 98 of these uh, persons were owning humans and trading them in the commercial uh, sexual business. These are the arrests, 105, last year alone in Florida. I couldn't find the number of victims. They don't report that, but it's a great deal more than 105. And these are just from the FBI website, what they report, not the watchdog websites that report a lot more. So we know there's injustice all around us. And it's not just human slavery. We know that churches in our area were initially not supportive of the civil rights movement of the 1960s. Now things have changed a lot since then, especially on the surface. We've integrated our worship spaces and we have African American and Korean American and Hispanic American pastors that are serving our churches But deep down, have things really changed? I mean, you have to ask yourself, when you encounter someone who is different, does any attitude creep up and affect the way that you speak or behave or treat them? African-American pastors, Korean-American pastors have told me, because of my friendships with them, that it's very hard knowing that the bishop can't just appoint them to any one of the churches in our area, that there are churches out there that won't have them as their pastor because they feel like the color of their skin means their culture must be different enough or their interpretation of the scripture must be different enough or their encounter with Christ and their worship of God must somehow be different that they can't possibly lead us in worship or teach us about Jesus Christ. Imagine Imagine if you just hear it plainly that that's how the world still operates. And in the church, still the most segregated hour of worship in the American week. In the church, there are still racist tendencies. Why? When we know God made us all, loves us all, calls us all into a relationship with him and to love of one another. Here, just in our own backyard last year, the FBI says there were 43 victims of racially motivated hate crime, 19 victims of religious motivated hate crime, and 32 victims of hate crime because of sexual orientation. In many of these instances, it resulted in death because of hate. And it is very hard for a crime to be named a hate crime by the FBI. And these are just the ones, again, in one year in our state that that people are actually exercising hate to the point of taking someone else's life. Forty-three people were killed last year because of the color of their skin. And we know that because of how hard it is to name something a hate crime. And I am proud of the current administration's hard stance against hate crimes. But how do we live in a society where we are still producing a citizenry that will take other person's lives because of hate and bigotry and race? 
human trafficking and hate crimes are just two of the injustices out there. That's before you even talk about poverty, education, a failing uh, foster system, the criminal justice system, our health care system, children who are trapped in impoverished lifestyles. And you know, it's children that are always the worst victims of injustice. It's children who are the voiceless masses that become the first to be abused and the first to be used, the ones that Christ called unto him, the ones whom God, since the beginning of monotheism, has been saying, take special care for the orphan, for the widow, and for the alien. In the face of all this injustice, where do we turn? Isaiah faced an injustice in the land, and he says in Isaiah chapter 59 these words, Justice is turned back, and righteousness stands at a distance, for truth stumbles in the public square, and uprightness cannot enter. Truth is lacking. And whoever turns from evil is despoiled. The Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no one, and was appalled that there was no one to intervene. You know, what's interesting to me about this Old Testament passage of Scripture, really all of them about justice, and the New Testament passage of Scripture that we read at the beginning of the sermon, is the focus on truth. Truth is so important for justice to be done in this world. God is looking for, searching for persons who will tell truth, who will say truth. And the truth is that we are in a crisis of justice today, just like the one that Isaiah was confronting with these incriminating words. It's a quiet crisis usually. It, it barely uh, rears its ugly head. But then what will happen is uh, a Bible study group will be slain because of the color of their skin. Or a young couple will be tormented and abused because of a religious practice. Or a child will be taken from an unlawful parent and put into a system that can't really defend, protect, nurture, or provide for the toddler. But then what always happens is the crisis seems to disappear almost as quickly as it appeared. And we think things are pretty just. I mean, you know, we, we think that Maybe everything is kind of just because we do believe in the United States, I think, in, in a false sense of the strength of justice. We believe that our country was founded, and it was, on the principle of liberty and justice for all. And therefore, we think we're a model of equality and opportunity for all persons. We're not living under a formal a system of apartheid. That's true. But we know that not everyone is treated equally and with the same amount of opportunity because we just talked about all these examples, or at least two, of great injustice being done right here within our own communities. We reassure ourselves that justice is alive and well here in the United States. But friends, it is not alive and well here in the United States, just like it's not alive and well anywhere in the world. It may be more alive here in the United States. And if it is, I think that brings God glory. But we can't just say we have justice and all is well. And we're not turning a deaf ear because as Isaiah says, and as any modern day prophet I think would share with him, justice is driven back and righteousness stands at a distance. Truth has stumbled in the streets and God must certainly be appalled that there is no one to intervene for the sake of righteousness. Friends, is there no one? Or can we be God's intervention? Can we be God's intervention as the church for justice in this world? We know we are supposed to be just. We've been called to be just. To be just is about how you feel. It, it, it is about what you value, how you set your priorities, the relationships that you create. Uh, to, to, to be just and to have a sense of justice must be informed, if you're a Christian, by the gospel of Jesus Christ or we don't believe it's real justice. At the very center 
of justice is love. And I know that it's simpler than it sounds because it has always been elusive and difficult to litigate and to create policies around love, to put into practice the Christian teaching. But the church, my call, is to help interpret the scriptures of God and let us all reflect upon what God is calling us to be and how he is calling us to live. My call is to help interpret scripture, not a book of civil law. A politician and a lawyer's job, it is their responsibility to interpret the law and really not the scripture. In fact, it would help if we'd all kind of stay in our lanes. We saw this this last week. It makes things too difficult sometimes when we cross over and start doing things that we're not qualified to do. And we know as Christians that we are called to be just because the Bible tells us the attribute of God is justice. If God is just, we must be. So friends, please hear me. When we are not just, or even more, when we fail to hear the cries of injustice, the cries of the oppressed from the bounds of injustice, then we fail to hear the cries and the supplication of God. The gospel tells us through the prophet Jeremiah that uh, he, God, will write his law on our hearts. Isn't that a beautiful thing? In Jeremiah 31, 33, God says, I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. That means that we are born with this intrinsic sense of knowing what is of God and what isn't. Jesus Christ, his life, his death, his resurrection is the fulfillment of this, which we call the new covenant. This is the new covenant a covenant, a promise, a law, a love that is written upon our hearts. So we know what is just and and what is unjust. We know what is right and what is wrong. It's there. But you see what happens over time is our justice monitors, if you will, they're marred by sin, just like the rest of us. And over time, they start to get dulled down. And it's harder for us to see and hear and recognize injustice. In fact, uh, it, it, to me, it's a lot like this. The, this is an Apple Watch. I have one of these things. I'm going to blame Levi for it. Um, but anyway, um, it, it, it has this thing called a haptic. If you don't know what that is, it's a fancy word for a vibration. And uh, anytime I get a phone call or a text message or an email or my watch thinks I need to stand up, it, it buzzes my wrist. And even though I have it set on the highest setting, which they warned me is called prominent, Sometimes I still don't feel it. I, I'm moving around or I'm talking or I'm involved in something. Even sometimes I'm reading something I'm so interested in, I fail to feel the little tingle in my wrist. And I think that that's kind of like how my justice monitor that God has put within me is. I mean, I see and I hear and I observe acts of injustice all over the world. And maybe it's because there are so many And they're in so many places that for me, it's just kind of like a tingle on my wrist. I look down and I see a news story about another school or church shooting. I see a news story about an act of gang violence or some culture somewhere in the world where another culture has just killed everyone because they're different. And I flip to the next story or move on to the next thing. I may say a prayer. I usually try to. I get a little bit of moral outrage, but just a little bit. It's more like a frustration. I wish that we weren't in this fallen and evil world. But does anything really change? Now, let me tell you something, friends. If someone does an act of injustice against me, oh, I feel it. 
That is like a fire alarm going off in every bit of my body. If someone does an act of injustice against me or someone I love that I'm in close proximity to, I feel it everywhere. And I'm talking about minor things compared to what people are suffering in this world. If someone offends me with their rudeness or their callousness, if someone accuses me of doing something wrong that I know I don't think that I did wrong. If somebody says, you know, that sermon was worthless. I want justice. I want it now. I feel like I am owed it. I feel like I deserve it. And I will do everything in my power to get myself justice. You see, what we owe Jesus Christ is for our monitors to be recalibrated so that when we see the pain and the suffering and the oppression of humankind in this world, it affects us a little bit more, a little bit like it affects us when we experience pain and suffering and oppression in our own lives. Our justice monitors need to be recalibrated. I want you to ask yourself, how finely tuned, how sensitive would you say you are to acts of injustice? To use God's language, how finely tuned or sensitive are you to acts of injustice against widows and orphans and aliens. To use Christ's language, how finely tuned and sensitive are you to acts of injustice against the least among us? One of the first Bible verses I ever learned was Micah 6, 8. We have it hanging in our kitchen because I really want to instill it in our children's lives, Elizabeth and I both. He has told you, O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice? to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. I know there's a difference between secular justice and biblical justice. I know that secular classical justice has to have a profound legal flavor, that in order to order society, we have to have uh, laws and policies. But I also believe that those laws and policies can be moral can express righteousness. And it is the job of the church to help influence the citizenry to be moral and to be righteous so that those who are writing and influencing policy might influence it for righteousness. That is biblical justice. Biblical justice is when God works to heal relationships, to redeem and heal communities and nations, and the world. The most obvious difference, I think, between secular justice and biblical justice is just the way we talk about it. In the secular world, we talk about people getting justice. In the Bible, you never hear language like that. In the Bible, we are taught to do justice. To do justice. Beyond Micah, who tells us that the Proverbs teach us that doing justice is more pleasing to God than even a sacrifice. It involves our personal and our communal lives. At the very core of justice is the love we read about in our passage of Scripture. Love that compels us to truth and to action. Because love expands our hearts. It heightens our sensitivities. It broadens our compassion. Therefore, if we exercise love, justice will naturally follow in its wake. And again, I know it's easier said than done. In fact, if it was as easy to do love as it is for me to say we should do love, I don't think that for the last month we would have had the problems we have had at our border. I don't think those tragedies would be there. And I know that many of you came to worship this morning hearing about maybe even just slightly or possibly reading the entire statement that the United Methodist Church, of which we are a part, uh, wrote a statement against separating children from their families of the migrant people coming to our borders. Many of you have asked me about it and emailed me about it and called me about it. And and I feel like because some time ago, eight months ago, before we knew about this, God called us to preach about justice. We need to say a word about what this was all about. How and why did the church get involved? Our own bishop, whom I love, wrote a statement that said, 
I implore Congress and the current administration to do all in their power to reunite these families. He went on to say, changes to these laws need to be addressed starting today. Let us join our voices in prayer for the separated families, for those working to end injustice, and for our nation's leaders. You see, as United Methodists, we attempt to read Scripture, to hear its truths, and to speak that news of biblical justice into the world. But it's not just us. Christians of all sorts and sizes and kinds and denominations came together to share statements. I mean, when the Graham family and the Southern Baptist Association is joining together with the United Methodists and the Episcopalians, something crazy is happening. I mean, when we're all getting on one page, and and one of the statements said this, Jesus is our way, our truth, our life. The Christ we follow would have no part in ripping children from their mother's arms or shunning those fleeing violence. It is unimaginable that faith leaders even have to say that these policies are antithetical to the teachings of Christ. It's heartbreaking that we have to say that out loud or share that or that we have a a society where because of citizenship, the family may be separated regardless of a holiness code. By the way, a lot of people learned about Leviticus this week. There's some trouble there too, I think, when we start reading Leviticus again and not exactly knowing what we're getting our hands on. not exactly knowing what we're getting into. The very beginning of the holiness code, God sets up. I'm about to give you some laws and some rules, but I'm going to remind you first that you're an alien, that you are a citizen of God, not of some nation, not of some place in this world. You have been aliens yourselves. And so it says at the very beginning of the holiness, in our Bible, the alien who resides with you shall be to you as a citizen among you, You shall love the alien as yourself, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt, and I am the Lord your God. Or as I read from last week's scripture in Zechariah, render true judgments, show kindness and mercy to one another. Do not oppress the widow, the orphan, the alien, the poor. Do not devise evil in your heart against anyone, but the people refused to listen. And therefore, great wrath came from the Lord of hosts. The laws can and should be moral friends. I could read scripture after scripture after scripture. And I know that, that just because I'm reading scripture doesn't give us a political solution. I know, and I'm not here to offer one because that's not my vocation. That's not my calling. But I know what is right God wrote it on our hearts. God spoke it to us in the scriptures. And we are supposed to speak truth. And let me tell you also, if we're going to speak truth, I don't want open borders. I don't. I don't want terrorists to be able to easily come into our nation. I think immigration needs to be addressed and discussed and litigated better. I I don't want human trafficking of children to be made easier across our borders. I want there to be fair and just laws. But I also have to remind myself, and it's hard for me to do, That while I love the fact that we proclaim to be one nation under God, that I do not worship or serve a God of one nation. I worship the God of all creation. I love our country. I want God to bless the United States of America. But the God I worship is the God of the universe. That's who we're called to serve and to adore. I praise God. That my great-grandfather, Joseph Elias Saliba, a man I knew and who I sat with even at his deathbed and heard this story, was 15 years old and was put on a boat by his mom and sent to this country with his 14-year-old arranged wife to try to make it into the country under political asylum. His name isn't at Ellis Island. It should be. I don't know all the details of that part of the story. I praise God that my grandfather a man who was one of my best friends in this world until he died just a few years ago. My grandfather broke the state law in Alabama. He was Lebanese. He married a small town, rural North Alabama girl. It was against the law, but the church endorsed it. The church blessed it, even though they knew they were breaking the law, interracial marriage. I don't exist 
if my great-grandfather had not gotten asylum in this country. I don't exist if racism had won instead of love. I don't exist if biblical justice had not prevailed. And maybe you're thinking, I shouldn't exist. (laughs) But I do. And the church stood by these persons who were feeling this injustice and said, we bless what you're doing. On Wednesday, the authors of the policy that separated children from their parents at the border revoked it. Due to all kinds of pressures, one of them was the church. They even said that. They insisted that the policy was used as a deterrent to crime. I think we should do a lot to deter crime. Not at all cost, but a lot. They said it was a political maneuver to, cr- to try and get immigration legislation addressed and passed. And I think we need that as well. But friends in Christ, that means we live in a world where those 2,300 children were allowed to be used for political maneuvering and posturing. Even those who imposed the policy revoked it because they said it was cruel to the children. Children were used as pawns. Last week, After that back-to-school bash made it in our announcements, someone asked our community missionary and visionary, Vivian, why she wanted to gather together the kids at Treasure Hill. She doesn't know I know this conversation. Why she wanted to have them come to this back-to-school bash. The person who asked her this knew why she was doing it. They just wanted to hear Vivian tell them because that's always fun. And... uh, Vivian said, well, if they have shoes and they have supplies when they go back to school, maybe they'll feel like they're somebody. Maybe they'll speak up. And I want to give the children a voice. If God's written it on our hearts, the ability to detect injustice and love and to do justice, surely we know when something is not just. I know I've preached enough, but... I just have to name one pitfall that's big and real. When we get into translating biblical justice into social justice, there are a lot of pitfalls, but one of the biggest is whenever we assert that one group is the instrument of God's righteousness and the other is not. We see this played out on the political stage every day of our lives, and it is wrong. A political party, either one or group, cannot claim to be the instrument of God's righteousness. The Bible refers to that as blasphemy. Our duty as the church and as pastors and theologians are to help people reflect and interpret Scripture in this world where it is hard to live out our faith. I acknowledge that. It is hard to live out the faith of Jesus Christ in this world, but it's not too hard. Because disciples have been doing it faithfully for 2,000 years. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, once said, Though we cannot think alike, may we not love alike? May we not be of one heart? Though we are not of one opinion, without all doubt we may. Herein all the children of God may unite, notwithstanding these smaller differences. So where do you begin when the sermon's over? Where do I begin if I believe all this that we just said? And remember, this is theology a la David Saliba. (laughs) But I think my best interpretation of Scripture, where we begin if we want to be just, is with ourselves. Because social justice, real justice, can only be known in this world from people who are founded in personal righteousness. Where we begin, throw yourself on Jesus Christ, on his teachings, on his life, on his example. Surely, as the church, we can all agree on that. To place ourselves in the teachings of Christ so that what we learn in his life may emanate outward from our lives. That will help us to not just talk about love, but to, as our scriptures implore us, to live love in truth and in action. And when we do that, friends, Amos' prophecy will be right. 
Justice will roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Not a little bit of trickle and a little bit of sprinkle over here of kindness and a little bit of love and just a tad bit of justice. No, no, no. The church is called to be an ever-flowing stream of righteousness and justice. That doesn't stop. Ever-flowing stream. When we are living into the commands of God and treating our uh, neighbors as ourselves, when we are loving God and loving one another as Christ has called us to, then we will be that ever-flowing stream of justice. And we will know, we will know that justice is blind to color and ethnicity, that our courts will be more fair, that people who are seeking and willing to work will be given that opportunity, that we will care better for this earth and for all the children here in it. And friends, this is what will happen if we become the ever-flowing stream. We know love by this, that Jesus laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and deeds and sees a brother or sister in need yet refuses to help? Little children, let us love not in word or speech, but in truth and action. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.